my name is Bill Amundsen, possibly descended from the famous Norwegian explorer, but most likely not. Looks like we're going to have another diminished soot in the mai this year. And when it's diminished like this, a lot of times, your thoughts turn to memories of more, well, interesting soot in the mai, more exclusive, more just memorable soot in the mai in the past. And in my case, I always wind up thinking about the soot in the mai of the 70s. In fact, last year, I wrote an article for The Hub about 70s soot in the mai. Rowdy 70s soot in the were nothing like today. And that certainly is true. A lot of you out there probably recall the soot in the of the 70s, but they might be fading because we're all aging. So I think it's important to bring this up yet again. Of course, this was in the early 70s, so things were a little different. Rules were looser. Uh, Morals and things weren't as tight. It was kind of part of the, uh, the, the 60s counterculture still, and a lot of that ran through even Stoughton. One of the big events of uh, 70s sit in the Mize was a party at Beaster's Park on Saturday, a softball game. It wasn't really Beaster's Park. It was called Beaster's Park because the Beaster brothers lived near the park. It was actually Pleasant Hills Park up there in the Pleasant Hill area. And this was sort of an alternative sit in the for the younger set. We even had our own royalty, a fellow named Jaco, AKA Thomas Jacobson, who would lord over the proceedings with a crown and a Norwegian flag as a cape and would take pictures of everything with an eight millimeter camera. Other than that, there was just hundreds of people that showed up and yes, amazingly as may sound, there was some copious consumption of beer. Back then, however, the Stoughton police kept their eye on the park and at the party and the Saturdays, and as long as the people there stayed at the park, the Stoughton police were okay with that, and everything was kind of balanced off. That went on for almost all of the 70s. But the most important place for Soot and Amai in the 70s was definitely right downtown Stoughton. It was a place called Rorgie's Tavern. Now, Rogi's Tavern is quite simply the greatest tavern in the history of the world. For many years, it was here in Stoughton, and it catered mostly to, uh, I guess, farmers, retired farmers, farmers that weren't farming that day, and they sat in the window of the tavern and played euchre all day and all night long, which, as kids, we could go and view with a lot of, well, entertainment um, aspects to it. But in the early 70s, the younger people discovered Rorgie's Tavern and it became kind of a center for the young. Now at this time, my friends and I were all at the University of Wisconsin and just raring to make trouble. And Rorgie's was an ideal place. One reason it was so ideal is their fabulous drink menu, which consisted of red ones for 25 cents, which were Budweiser's in a glass, or a 25 cent blue one, which was a PBR. And that was the extent of their drink menu. Gilmore Rorge was a rather cheap fellow, but he noticed that as more young people came in, perhaps he could capitalize on this interest, especially over Soot and Amai. And in the 70s, he started actually hiring bands, and it was the place to be. The Rorge's was full the entire weekend, and crowds would spill out onto the street. My friends and I would hang out down there and basically come up with all kinds of goofy notions. At one time, we decided to invent an organization called the Anti-Ludifisk League. We decided that Ludifisk wasn't the way to go and we would be against it. This is one of the flyers back in the day. We had this crazy goal that we would, we would actually hijack a truck full of Ludifisk and destroy it in this big, you know, attempt to be subversive. Of course, we didn't know where Ludifisk trucks were, and the other problem was simply that it's impossible to destroy Ludifisk, as people pointed out to us. It takes a good 10,000 years for Ludifisk to deteriorate at all, and usually it's best if it's buried in a mountain range somewhere near Nevada. But we spent most of our time at Rorgi's actually just singing good old Norwegian songs, folk songs, novelty songs, songs of, well, historic import, and some songs that didn't have such historic import. One of our favorites was um, a tune that everybody in Stoughton knows, Just a Little Lefsa. In fact, I think you have to know this song to get your citizenship card. If you haven't done this yet, go to the city hall sometime around Sitnamai. It goes like this. Yes, a little lefsa will go a long way. Give you indiation most every day. Put it on your menu, you'll look and say, Yes, the little lefsa will go a long way. This song had about 35 verses. You can Google it. So it could take up a good half hour of group singing at Rorgi's Tavern. 
Another song that we really enjoyed, especially uh, when my father would come down, was a tune that was his favorite of all Norwegian novelty songs. It was called Vias Don't Give a Hoot. I think he liked it because of this particular verse. He was an, a pilot all his life, and so it had meaning to him. Vias don't give a hoot. Vias don't give a hoot. We got plenty troubles, but Vias don't give a hoot. There was a man named Janssen, as crazy as a loot. He thought he'd build a flying machine out of a chicken coop. He went to bed one night. He dreamed he looped a loop. Then he got up the next morning and he went and flew the coop. Oh, we just don't give a hoot. And then we could sing that verse for a good 15 minutes as well. But the song that meant the most to us was a song of dubious origins. It was called Cle Da De. And we all knew it and sang it religiously. We weren't sure exactly what Cle Da De meant, but we knew it was a folk song. Allow me to sing it for you now. Pardon me, let me start over. after dark. It's a lovely song to sing, as you can obviously tell, but it was questionable as, as far as being an authentic folk song. For one thing, I don't recall folk songs in years gone by that it ended with the line, Stoughton after dark, or Clur da du, duck du, Esther Haugen, Clur daka, Ica yaka, Stoughton after dark. In fact, we weren't quite sure what Ica yaka even meant. But the other thing is Esther Haugen was in the song. And we all knew Esther Haugen because she was our elementary school music teacher, beloved woman in the community. In fact, Esther Haugen was the first queen of Sutton Am I when they instigated that. And uh, my friends all thought we somehow learned this song from Esther Haugen. And I think that might be the case. In fact, in the early 60s, an album came out, Sounds of Sutton Am I. The Stoughton Chamber of Commerce presented it. It doesn't have a date on it, but I recall seeing it in the early 60s. It's on the Cuco Record Corporation label, which was very big in southern Wisconsin. Big, big polka label. So this is very legitimate. And I'll be darned if on the back there aren't a bunch of songs featuring Mr. and Mrs. Odvar Haugen, Esther Haugen and her husband. Now, I'm sorry to say it doesn't have Cle da de on here, but it has a lot of other ones like Ale du Fer and Jag Harde Ellering. Anyhow, we determined that most of us had listened to this when we were kids and got the idea of Norwegian folk tunes in, in our blood. And also that Cle da de was something we must have known from grade school on. Years later, after doing a little bit of research, I found out that Cle da de is actually a folk song from over a century ago called Carl and His Chickens. And the Cle da de cluck a clue or whatever was actually just the sound of chickens clucking. It was a big important portion of the song. But somehow over the years, it morphed into Cle da de, Esther Haugen entered the picture, Stoughton After Dark, and it became a song everybody sang at Rorgies during 70s Sutton Am I. I'm not sure, but I think that's the way folklore and culture works. Not always pretty, but. This record also has a, a whole side of favorite Norwegian folk songs by the Goose Island Ramblers. Those of you that are old enough to recall their rowdy shows at Johnny's Packer Inn on Cottage Grove Road know that they were really fun and really Norwegian oriented. However, the one we sang at Rorgies wasn't really a Stoughton based song. I'll just sing a couple lines because the song only has a couple lines. There's no Norwegians in Dickieville, none in the valley and none on the hill. There never was and there never will be no Norwegians in Dickieville. But again, we could stretch that out to a good 20 minutes of rowdy singing at Rorgies. It's not really a song, but one of our favorite things everybody knew in the early 70s was a chant. I guess it was more of a chant than a song. It went like this. We are just some cart from Stoughton, come up here for a real good time. Yumpin yimini, I feel yali, ya for sure us carp ain't tame. Yumpin yimini, I feel yali, ya for sure us carp ain't tame. Now there's some fancy Norwegian syntax. This particular tune um, was something that 
actually had a history too. The people that I've hung out with at Rorgies back in the 70s have been talking about this to this day, and we've even found variations on that tune and that chant, if you want to call it a tune. Anyhow, supposedly it goes back to the immigration days. The first wave of Norwegian immigrants came here after the Civil War in about 1870, 1880, and they settled into Stoughton and built themselves a very nice lifestyle. Later on, around 1890 and the turn of the century, a new wave of Norwegian immigrants showed up. And these were uncouth, young, rowdy people that probably led to the kind of Stoughton behavior that we were practicing in Rorgies in the 70s. Anyhow, the older folks looked down their nose at these young immigrants and referred to them as carp, based on the kind of, well, fish of low renown in the Ahara River. And of course, these young people didn't like being called carp, but at a certain point they thought, well, why don't we just take the term carp and flip it on its side and turn it into a, um, a, pri a pride kind of thing, I guess, a moniker of pride, something they can go around and say, we are carp from Stoughton. And supposedly it stuck for a long time. A certain portion of the segment of Stoughton population referred to themselves as carp. And when I was growing up, once in a while, old timers would show up and talk about carp town. It turns out this, we are just from carp from Stoughton morphed into something that people think was probably a cheer at athletic events in as late as the 30s and 40s. And so it would go, we are just some carp from Stoughton, come up here to win this game. So it has something to do with athletic events, but like everything, it morphed into something completely different. If anybody knows anything about the yump and yemeny I feel yali line and how it ties into the carp thing, that would be wonderful. Um, after I wrote this article, I got a lot of response from people that kind of recall sitting am I in the 70s. And amazingly enough, I got three different stories that were all the same. And they had something to do with Rorgies and kind of reflect the, uh, the times, I guess you could say. And the story went like this. My friends and I were in a car and we were at the stoplight at Division Street. There was three of us in the car, minding our own business, and suddenly, Rorgies opened up, the door opened up, and five or six very large men came out. They surrounded our car, they picked our car up, they turned it 180 degrees and set it back down on the street, and then they ran back into the tavern laughing hysterically. True or not, I'm not sure, but I heard it from three different people. One was with his parents, one was with his girlfriend, one with, with, was with a bunch of buddies. Anyhow, I think that kind of sums up the way Sutnamai was back in the day. And by the way, kids, this isn't a practice that you should probably indulge in now. Eventually, well, things got out of hand. Um, each Sutnamai got a little bit wilder. Eventually, motorcycle gangs started coming to town. The notorious CC riders from Madison would come down here and party. And I think things finally came to a head in May of 1975. At this time, there was actually a beer tent out at the North Chalet, a very respectable restaurant. Of course, now the North Chalet area houses the now defunct Shakers, which is anything but respectable and isn't even open. Anyhow, I was in a band on stage, a village players band called Clint Jordan and the Crevulettes playing really, really bad cover songs, but the bikers didn't seem to think so. In fact, one was so enthusiastic, he fired a pistol into the top of the tent two times. And that basically was the beginning of the end of Sitnamai's in the 70s. They continued to be rowdy. They continued to have a lot of activity, but it began getting rained in each year, and pretty soon they were just nothing but a memory, which, to be honest, is probably a very good thing for the sake of all of us. And Rorgies, well, Rorgies eventually closed and became the Hallmark store. But I noticed the Hallmark store is for sale. So if somebody would like to buy the Hallmark store and turn it into Rorgies and get all this stuff going again for the upcoming Roaring Twenties, well, you probably don't want to think about that. I don't think city officials would like it, but we sure could use some sort of business in that establishment. And that is my little monologue about Sutnamai in the 70s. Thank you for listening. Guten Tag.